Hi, I'm Dr. Charles Blackstock, and I pastor the Lighthouse Baptist Connection, Church in Dawsonville, Georgia. Thank you for tuning in today to the Faith Connection together. broadcast. These programs are recorded live at our church each week at our services on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock and Sunday night at 6 o'clock, and then again on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. We would love for you to be a guest at our church and join us for our services. I believe you'd find our people to be friendly and you'd find a great welcome in our church. We would love to have you as our guest. You can find out more about Lighthouse Baptist Church by going to our website at lighthouse-baptist.com. We really hope these programs are a blessing to you today. And thank you again for tuning in to the Faith Connection broadcast. We're going to learn tonight about what, uh, the, what truth that everybody should know. That's what the Bible is. Um, you think, well, I, I know what a Bible is. Um, you'd be surprised how many people don't have a, a very good knowledge of what the Bible is. Um, I hear people say, in fact, I was uh, talking to somebody one day, and they, they made this statement. They said, um, well, the Bible was just written by King James anyway. <laughs> and they were serious. They, they really believed that. And um, uh, there is a, a great deal of... Um, a great lack of knowledge, I should say. I sorry to say a great deal of ignorance, but that sounds a little harsh. But there's a, there's a lack of knowledge concerning uh, the Word of God. In Hebrews chapter 4 and uh, verse number 12, the Bible says, For the Word of God is quick, that means living, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Uh, the Bible is a very different book than any other book. You can read the newspaper and you, can, you get the thoughts of man. You read a novel and you get the thoughts of man. But the Bible is a, is a spiritual book. It's a living book. It's a book that was inspired by God and um, uh, it speaks to us. Not only do we, we, uh, we read it our, and what we see and what we understand, but the Bible has a unique ability to speak to us in a very spiritual way. So tonight we're going to jump into this and, uh, and look uh, uh, about a few things. The Bible is, um, it is God's Word. Uh, it's God's Word. It's not just a, a, man, a man's book. It's not something that was written by man. We're going to show you a little bit about how that came into being. First of all, we're talking about the Bible was revealed by God. Revealed by God. The Scriptures tell us uh, in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 12, For I received, neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of God. And um, so we see that it, was, uh, it, it came into being by the way of revelation. Uh, that means that it's not something that man thought up. It's something that man would have never thought up on his own. It had to be revealed by God. We have so many proofs to this, and I wish I could take the time now to talk about all the proofs of the Bible. You know, um, uh, recently when um, Bill Nye was uh, debating um, Ken Ham, and he kept saying, well, if the Bible could just predict something, and I thought, well, my soul, it's predicted so many things. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, it's proven itself long before scientists discovered such things as ocean currents and uh, rain cycles and, uh, and the earth being around. All these things were told, foretold uh, in a way that uh, man didn't discover that for hundreds, even uh, centuries later, hundreds of years later. The only way that could be written in the Bible that way before man came to realize it is if somebody that had foreknowledge knew it. Therefore, uh, it's revealed by God. Not only do we see the revelation of God, but it's inspired by God. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter 1, 21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so, it, um, it, not only did it come uh, by the way of, um, of um, revelation, but inspiration. The Bible said in 2 Timothy, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable. For doctrine, it came by way of inspiration, and then number three, it came by way of it, we've got it by way of preservation, and so we find uh, that um, <clears throat> that God has preserved it in Second Timothy three sixteen. Well, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, but in Psalms the Bible tells us that um, that He would preserve it, He would keep it from one generation uh, to the next, and so we see in this chart here tonight, I just want to take just a little bit of time and try to help you appreciate how the Bible came into being. As we look at the, the chart up on the screen, we see that God brought this, this uh, God is, uh, is all knowledge. He's uh, omnipotent, if you will. And he chose to reveal some things to us by, by way of speaking to holy men. I've used uh, a funnel 
uh, as an illustration of why I, what I refer to these holy men. You see, if you take a, a liquid and you pour it through a funnel, all it does is it takes something from a larger vessel and allows it to be poured into a smaller vessel, but it doesn't change what goes through it. And, and when God inspired the, the Word of God, what He did was He took holy men and He revealed something to them and He funneled it through them from His infinite knowledge down to a, uh, to a written book. So He takes and, and he, he revealed it to holy men and they were inspired to write it down. Uh, and, and many times the, we see that the revelation may have just been a, a spoken word. The prophecy came not in old time about holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And then sometimes those same men, like Moses, would write down what they were given to prophesy. In other situations, um, somebody else would uh, speak it. Many, like the, the, the many things that Jesus said, Mark wrote them down, Matthew wrote them down, Luke wrote them down, John wrote them down. Uh, but in some cases, one person would, would, uh, would speak these things and somebody else would record them. And um, so... God inspired, God brought the word to us by way of inspiration. That literally means that God breathed out these things from his own uh, source. I, I believe it as simply as I believe a funnel doesn't change what flows through it. Neither does man have, an, have had any say about what was written down. God superintended the writing of his word so much so that, um, that uh, the words are the words of God, not the words of man. And so we see that um, uh, the, the scriptures came by revelation through holy men, and they were inspired. Inspiration has to do with the writing down of the scriptures. So we find out, here they come down to these originals, the, the, the vellum parchment tablets that were uh, vehicles by which the word was recorded or written, if you will. And then through the course of time, they, they were copied, and these scriptures were used by the early churches. And uh, as time progressed, uh, this collection of scriptures, it had the hand of God upon it. And God oversaw this. He supernaturally made sure that the things that were of him remained. The Bible said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. And so God oversaw that that which was, which was inspired by him retained its uh, integrity and remained intact. And that which was not passed away. It found out that maybe that somebody predicted something and it didn't come to be true. Or the teaching contradicted something that Jesus gave us. And so over the course of time, uh, the, what we refer to as the, as the canon of Scripture came, came into being and uh, the books were compiled into one book, which we refer to as the Bible. 66 books uh, written by 39 different authors over the course of our 1,500 years, and the Bible comes into being. And so we have a single book referred to as the Holy Bible. And uh, particularly, we look at the text that that comes from in the New Testament is the, the Textus Receptus. And that is a term that was coined uh, several hundreds of years ago, and it referred to the received text. It's just, it's just Greek for the, the, the received text or that which that the New Testament churches accepted as uh, the true word of God. And God used that process to purify and uh, to filter out that which was not. And then in 1600s, around, you know, early 1600s, uh, a, a, a project came into being under the leadership of, of King James. And he put together 54 different men, seven of them um, uh, passed off the scene and it left 47 men. They were divided into Six different groups. Two were in Oxford at the, at the University of Oxford. Two at the University of two groups were at the University of Cambridge, and two at the University of Westminster. And they took, undertook the task of translating from the original languages into the English language the Word of God, which we now use and know as the King James Bible. And for over 400 years, it has been uh, referred to as the authorized Word of God. It has stood the test of time and proved itself to be a valid and a proper and a preserved translation of the original inspired Word of God. Amen. And so we can look at our, our, our course and see that today what we have, when we, when we hold in our hands a King James Bible, we actually have a Bible that can be traced back to the original revelation. It goes back through the King James translators, to the scriptures that were referred to as the Textus Receptus, which were copies of the originals, which came by way of inspiration, whereby holy men of God that God moved upon revealed, were given revelation that only came from God. So we can trace uh, tonight, when we actually, when I, when I preach to you from this King James Bible, I can trace it back to its roots, its origin with God himself. Can I get a witness? This is not a man-written uh, book. It's a book that uh, came by way of God. Now, 
having said that, I want, to know that, want you to know that the Bible has many counterfeits. And over the course of time, many people have, have tried to change or distort or alter the Word of God. The Scriptures tell us that you should not add unto the Word. Why would there be such an admonition if people weren't trying to do that? Uh, which I, he said, which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. And in, Pro, in, in Proverbs chapter 30, the Bible says, and thou shalt... Not add unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. And so, uh, certainly over the course of time, people have tried to change the Word of God. Uh, I can't go into an exhaustive study of that tonight, but I do want you to see there's a difference between what we refer to as the pure stream and the polluted stream. The, the pure stream is that which I just talked to you about. It comes by way of God through revelation. Inspired men wrote that down. These scriptures were copied, and they were used and circulated amongst the early churches. And they were, they were compiled into one book. And then they were translated in our English language, and we hold in our hand from a pure stream a, a King James Bible that comes by way of a pure stream. Um, but there's another set of documents that, uh, that came into being, and if you'll follow this out, a man, there's an error that points out, there's a man by the name of Origen. He lived in Alexandria, Egypt, and, uh, in the third century after Christ. And um, he authored a book called the Hexapola, which included in that was um, a revision of the Septuagint. Um, and uh, he also wrote many other things. He was a man that, that leaned heavily on the, the, the ideas that Clement and uh, Philo and even Plato and some of the uh, other Greek philosophers uh, had. Uh, Philo was a man that believed in what was referred to as logos, or basically that, that God is an idea, that God is not uh, a real person, that he's not uh, a, a real, it doesn't have to do with matter per se, but it has to do with an idea. And that, 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 I, the, that this, this, this idea uh, as, as we get to a place of enlightenment, we become a part of this, this great idea. It's not a whole lot different than some of the New Age lies of today. The New Age lies is nothing but an age-old age old lie. Um, but then uh, a man named Clement was the head of this school in Alexandria, and he was a Gnostic. And, and that was kind of a twist on, on the, um, the, the idea of Logos, in which the Gnostics um, believed that knowledge itself was, was God, and that, um, that we reached an enlightenment through knowledge, more than just an idea, which is uh, uh, kind of uh, not, not anything tangible. Knowledge seemed to be more tangible. It could be knowledge from books and literature and philosophy and such as that. And um, so as we gain knowledge that, that man could reach an enlightened stage. And so what uh, Origen literally did was he took the, the Bible and he took the Old Testament writings to the Septuagint. So the Septuagint is just a, the Greek Old, the Old Testament translated into Greek. And he began to distort these things to fit his new philosophy. It was very important in those days that people had a following because the way they made money is that they had students that come to learn under them. And he had taken over the school there in Alexandria. And as the headmaster of that school, uh, as a teenager, he began to write uh, and began to um, uh, teach things. And as he gathered students, uh, he needed to back up what he was saying. The truth of the matter is um, the early church leaders uh, excommunicated him. They, they, they kicked him out and said he was a heretic and that he was teaching false doctrine. They would have nothing to do with him. Uh, but uh, in that school that was uh, so rooted uh, in Greek philosophy and, and other um, lies, he found a following. And from that, he began to uh, distort not only the Septuagint and uh, other writings, but he distorted the Textus Receptus. He took the Bible that came out of the churches uh, around Jerusalem and the, the regions where Paul and others were starting churches in the first century. And he took that and began to alter it and to distort it and to produce a new text that came uh, by way of the man Origen. Uh, years later, when Constantine became the Roman emperor, he, of course, uh, had this vision of a cross and thought that he conquered by the cross, and he decided to Christianize the world. Well, a, a pagan leader of a pagan empire that wants to Christianize the world needed a, a book, a textbook, if you will, to indoctrinate everybody in this new religion. So he, uh, uh, he appointed or he commissioned a man by the name of Eusebius to produced 50 Bibles that would be spread throughout the, the region in certain of their major churches for the teaching of this, uh, this new Roman religion. And uh, Eusebius took the work of origin of several hundred years prior and, and produced these Bibles uh, and uh, propagated again this corrupted Greek text, if you will.
We'll follow the trail down a little bit further, and we see two guys come on the scene in the 1800s by the name of Westcott and Hort. And they took this text that was, uh, uh, that was produced by Eusebius that actually was Origen's work, his corrupted work, and this is all traced back very clearly. And no, people uh, don't deny the fact that, that Westcott and Hort found a Greek text that came by way of Eusebius, uh, that, that came by way of Origen. And Origen's work is obviously a recension or a, a renovation, a modification, if you will, of the Textus Receptus. And so now what we have is new English versions that are based upon the Westcott and Hort Greek text, which is dramatically different than the Textus Receptus. And so what I would present to you tonight is, and it's very important that you understand, not only that we have, uh, we base our belief on, on the Bible, which is the Word of God, but we also base our belief on the pure stream of the Word of God. The Bible says, uh, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. We need to, to get the incorruptible word of God, the one that hasn't been changed or altered. God says there's a, there's a curse, a plague, a judgment upon those who alter the word of God. And truly, Origen set about to change the scriptures to fit his philosophy. And likewise, Constantine wanted a Bible that fit a, a paganized Christianity, not a true Christianity. And, and, and many people today are being uh, led astray because they are not reading necessarily from the pure Word of God. Now, am I saying that all Bibles that are not King James have no, no validity? I'm not saying that at all. I think there's some truth in there. But it would be the, the question I would present to you if I had a table in front of me and I said, um, there's, uh, there's 10 glasses of water. One of them is pure poison and one of them is pure water. And in between, there are varying degrees of poison. Which one do you want? I want the pure water. Amen. I don't want the varying degrees of poison. I don't want the most poisonous one uh, or the less poisonous one. I want the pure water. I want the pure water of life. Amen. Amen. And so if you want to get something, you find out that uh, you say, well, preacher, um, what's even more pure? Well, I believe God preserved the, 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 the word of God in the King James Bible through the, in the English language. I believe it's the preserved word of God. If you wanted to study deeper than get into Greek and Hebrew and, and study the original languages, um, but to, for us and for most intents and purposes, we can gather everything that we need from our King James Bible in the English language. And I think as a student, uh, it would do well to study the, the Greek and the Hebrew. I, I dabble in it a little bit. I'm not a scholar by any means, but I do know this, that um, I have found uh, the Word of God in the English language to be the preserved Word uh, for God's people. Amen. And so um, uh, we find that uh, we have a pure stream and we also have a polluted stream. Now, as we look at this Bible, I want you to see that the Bible is a book above all others. And this is um, something that's very important, particularly for young people to appreciate, that it's a book that's uh, above all others. Um, the Bible tells us the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The law of the Lord is, a, is another term that you use to describe the Word of God. It's perfect, converting the soul. The testimony, that's another description of the Word of God. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are um, <clears throat> All right, rejoicing the heart, and the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. And so uh, the Bible is the book of all others, number one, because uh, it's a perfect book. <laughs> the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. There are, um, <clears throat> there are no errors in this Bible. I hear people sometimes say, well, the Bible's full of errors. And, and my question has always been, uh, give me one of them. No, now, there may be, you know, even when the King James Bible was, uh, was translated, uh, the, the printing processes uh, whereby it was printed uh, the, were not the, the best in the world, and there were errors uh, as far as printing errors, okay? I mean, I can accept that. The truth is, as far as contradictory errors, I, you won't find any. Uh, you may find some things that you don't understand yet. It takes you a little bit of time to dig a little bit deeper, but the Bible will not contradict itself, and the Bible has no errors, and any prophecy the Bible ever has ever spoken of uh, has um, come into being and has never failed or is yet to be um, yet to come, uh, come forth. But there's never been a prophecy that has, been, uh, has failed to happen uh, or happened in a different way. God's Word has always proved itself to be uh, a perfect book. Amen? Uh, it has uh, the truth about salvation. Um, you can find this. You can look at, at the religions, uh, whether they be false religion or the, whether they be so-called Christian religions. It's amazing to me that so many things are referred to as Christian religions, and yet it, when people, uh, when you look at them, they're, they're, the people are just as in bondage in that religion as people who don't uh, claim to be Christians. But when you find people <laughs> that meet Jesus Christ on the terms of this book and accept Him as their Savior and confess Him as Lord and repent of their sins uh, and they genuinely get born again, you find freed people. Amen. You find a people that um, have found the truth about salvation. 
and uh, the Bible is to be that which overrules any other religious dogma or teachings. Um, when we come to this church, uh, we have a statement of faith, but it clearly expresses in the very first opening paragraphs of that statement of faith that these are things that, try, that describe what we believe the Bible teaches. But in all cases, the Bible's true above anything else. Uh, if it's ever found that something that was stated in our statement of faith uh, is contradicted uh, somewhere by a scripture, well, let the Bible be true and let men be all, all men be liars. And so, number one, it's a perfect book. Number two, it's a sure book. The Bible says the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the, the simple. <clears throat> you can trust the Bible to always uh, be true. Bible principles will make you wise. And it's amazing how that continues to play out. And I wish I could just uh, uh, I could help young people to, to grasp this truth that, that uh, there, is a, there is something. The Bible says it's sure. The testimony of the Lord is sure. You know, we, you live in a day and time in which um, uh, you've been lied to and said that there's no absolute absolute truth. <laughs> but there is an absolute truth. Amen. Whatever God says is true is true. Whatever God says is false is false. Uh, whatever God says is holy is holy. And whatever God says is sinful is sinful. And it'll always be that way. No matter what people say about it, you can deny what you want to. But in our day and time, we've, be, we've found it easy to deny the word of God. But in the course of it all, um, people are uh, living on, on medications and, and uh, psychiatry and uh, they're having nervous breakdowns and uh, they're living in paranoia and Fear, and all the problems that come from not being right with God and right with his word. And those people, though, that uh, are right with God, they live in God. The Bible says that the Lord will keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Amen. And, uh, you know, other sources for knowledge will lead you astray, but the Bible will always lead you in the right path. Amen. It's a sure book. Not only is it a sure book, but it's also a right book. Um, you know what God's word says will always be right in your life and following the word of God will make you a, a joyful person. It'll give you a joyful life and, it, and it's always right. It's sure. You can depend upon it. it will, you, you know, sometimes uh, people say, well, I tried this and it worked for me one time. I can't guarantee you to work for you. And the Bible never says that. What the Bible says is that if you do it the way God says, it'll work. It's a sure prophecy. It's a right book. It, it'll lead you in the right path. God's word will never lead you in the wrong direction. You can count on that. There's a lot of, a lot of people telling people which way to go, and it doesn't wind up where they thought it was going to. But, but God's word will never lead you wrong. It's a right book. And uh, God intends for us to know his word. Amen. God intends for us to know this book. And, and so as, uh, as we approach the Bible, it's important that we not only realize uh, that it is an inspired book. It's a, it's a special book. It's a holy book. It's an absolute truth. It's, a, it's the Word of God. There's none like it, uh, nothing to compare it to. We should let it be the foundation for all that we, all that we think and believe. But to do that, we're going to have to know His Word. The first thing that God tells us to do is we're to desire it like food. As newborn babes desire you the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. God says we want to want the Word of God. Uh, I would say today, if you have no, absolutely no hunger for the Word of God, uh, either you've gotten so steeped in sin or you never got saved. But a, a, a baby doesn't have to be, you don't have to wake a baby up and say, baby, it's time to eat, honey. Come on, get up and wake up, honey. It's time to eat. No, that baby will wake up hungry, crying for food. Amen. And a child of God that's born again wants to, uh, to, to learn about his God. Um, we should desire it like food. Uh, the things that, uh, that cause us not to is if we start feeding on the wrong things. Love not the world, the Bible says. Um, you know, if uh, you um, get used to eating the wrong things, sometimes it's really hard to enjoy the good things. Uh, I think what we need to do is get back to the Word of God. Amen. Desire it like food. Number two, study it. The Bible says, study it, show thyself approved unto God. A work we need is not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. God says that not only we're to, uh, to desire it, but we're to study it. Um, I, I'm, I, there's a great blessing uh, for studying this book. Amen. Um, to, to rightly divide it. I think one of the most important things for young people to gather is principles from the Word of God. You, you know, we can read all the Bible stories, and I think that's great. As, we, as, as young people are growing up, they read about David and Goliath and Daniel and the lion's den and the three Hebrew boys. And, but as they get a little older, they need to learn what principles can I draw from this and, uh, you know, what are the, the things that govern my life? What made Daniel such a great young man? I'll tell you what made him such a great man. He, he, listen, he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. And so there's a principle there. If you want to have the wisdom of Daniel, then don't defile yourself. 
Amen? If you want to have the, the power of a David, then walk by faith and not by sight. The David said the battle is the Lord's, and we need to learn these principles of God and the principles of the Word of God, and we won't, we won't do that unless we rightly divide it by studying it and learning it. And the Bible says we're to memorize it. Psalm 119, 11 says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. And God says to memorize. There's something special about having the Word of God in your heart. I was just preaching uh, this weekend in Lincoln, Illinois at Park Meadows Baptist Church, and and uh, I was speaking to the people about how God spoke to me in prayer. You've heard me tell the story about how one morning in frustration, I cried out to God and said, God, teach me about how I'm supposed to pray. And immediately he brought a scripture to my mind that I'd memorized uh, 25 years prior. And it was still there that God could just bring it up and speak to me about it. Had I not had that verse in my head and in my heart, uh, then it would have been very difficult for God to lead me in the direction he did. Um, but it was there for him to instantaneously bring to my remembrance. And we're to memorize the word of God and hide it in our heart that we might not sin against God. It's amazing how the Holy Spirit of God uses the word of God to, to, to not only convict us when we're headed the wrong direction, but to confirm us when we're headed in the right direction. Amen. And then we're to meditate upon it. Paul told young Timothy, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. The truth of the matter is that we are supposed to uh, not just... Um, uh, to, to, to study it and to memorize it, but we're to meditate upon it. That means we're to spend a lot of our time uh, thinking upon, dwelling upon what the Bible has to say. What does it say to me? What does it mean for my life? Uh, uh, where do I come in, 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 in relation to it? Am I obedient to it? Am I disobedient to it? Uh, we don't read it like we do. Uh, you, know, um, you know, scrolling down Facebook posts and just skimming through them until we see uh, uh, something we're interested in. No, we take the time to read it, to study it, to memorize it, and then meditate upon it. Uh, think upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. Oh, it's a blessed, wonderful book, the Word of God. Amen? Uh, for by the Word of God, the, Paul said, uh, the Holy Spirit of God used Paul to write down these words, um, uh, search the Scriptures. Uh, why? Because in them you'll find uh, the, the plan of salvation. You'll, you'll have, you can find eternal life. Amen? It's the Word of God that leads us to Jesus Christ. It's the Word of God that leads us to the truth that, that makes us free. Uh, in Jesus uh, was telling, uh, it was recorded in John chapter 8. He said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed and shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I've oftentimes heard people say, and the truth shall set you free. And I wonder sometimes, is there a difference between set free and made free? And then uh, meditating upon that thought, uh, this, uh, this idea came to my mind. Uh, you know, if, um, if I had been incarcerated for something, and somebody came by and uh, uh, slipped by and found a key and opened the door, and opened it, the, the, the prison door and, and said, run, run. They would set me free. But if they catch me, they're going to incarcerate me again. But if somebody came to that door and opened it up and handed me some papers and said, you're a free man, I've been made free. And nobody can come back after me. I have, I'm free indeed. Amen. And that's what Jesus Christ did when he saved me. He made me free from the penalty of sin. And when I get into his word and the lies of the devil would enslave me and teach me to do, uh, to lead me to do things I shouldn't do. If I know the truth, it makes me a free person. I don't have to live in darkness or deception. Amen. I can live by the faith of the Son of God. What a blessed book it is. Everybody ought to know what the Bible is. So somebody says, uh, that's just a book written by man. You say, no, it's not. By, the Bible came by way, first of all, of revelation. And how did he do that? He, he gave holy men of God inspiration. He spoke to them that they might pin it down. All scripture was given by inspiration of God. And then the psalmist said that he preserved it from this generation forever. And so God said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word will never pass away. And so we can count on the fact that uh, there will always be available to us uh, the word of God. Uh, God will preserve it and keep it for us. And uh, it's not so much if it's here. The question is, uh, are we going to read it? Are we going to study it? Are we going to memorize it? Are we going to meditate upon it? Are we going to hide it in our heart? And um, I, I challenge you tonight to, to know your Bible. It's the, it's the blessed manu the, the, the instruction manual that God has given us. Uh, we're about to live our lives successfully down here to know our Savior and to uh, witness for Him and have all the freedom and the power that God makes available to us this side of eternity. Amen? I wonder not, do you, do you know the Lord? The truth is, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, uh, the Bible is a, is a mysterious book. The Bible says that uh, 
The natural man receiveth not the things of God. They're foolishness unto him. If you would come to Christ and accept him as your Savior, you'll find like I did. For years and years, the Bible made no sense to me. But when I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, this book came alive. And it began, began, became a new book to me. And all of a sudden, the things that didn't make any sense became understandable. And God will open this book up to you if you'll open your heart up to Jesus Christ. Thank you for tuning in to Faith Connection. I really hope the broadcast was a blessing to you today. These programs are produced through Lighthouse Global Studios which is a ministry of Lighthouse Baptist Church. We broadcast them locally, and we also send them out through Christian Media International for broadcasting all the world. I want to personally invite you to attend Lighthouse Baptist Church. I believe you could be a part in helping us get the gospel around the world. I also believe that our church could be a blessing to you and to your family. We have programs that minister to youth and adults, and we have music that's enjoyable and worshipful, and I believe you'd find our people to be friendly and to be welcoming. Once again, thank you for watching Faith Connection today, and I do hope the program was a blessing. Thank you for tuning in to Faith Connection, where we help you connect to God.